Exodus chapter 20, verse 26. HCSB says, You must not go up to my altar on steps so that your nakedness is not exposed on it. And then we have Genesis 3.21, our secondary opening text for this series from the New King James Version. It says, Also for Adam and his wife, Yahweh Elohim, made tunics of skin and clothed them. May Yahweh bless his word to our hearts today. So in my first sermon, this particular moon on modesty, I laid some groundwork from both of these texts. I talked about them as in-depth as I know how to talk about them. And then last week, we covered some more about the tunic, and then we looked at Deuteronomy 22 and 5, a favorite text among the Pentecostals and the Fundamental Baptists. And it's one of my favorite texts, too, because it's in the Torah. I just think that it gets misunderstood. We covered that last week in its cultural context. Today, I want to deal with a few more points from Scripture, and then I want to give you some practical advice and some encouragement on modesty in dress, outward modesty. So, I ended last week with the point that there is nowhere in the Bible that defines pants being a man's garment. After my lesson, Brother Arnold approached me and he said, he asked me, he said, what did you say that some men have told you about your tunic to make fun of you? He said, did I hear you right? I said, yeah, Brother Arnold, you heard me right. I told him, I said, I've had some men ask me, where'd you get your dress? Brother Arnold said, next time they ask you that, tell them all men used to get dressed. We're su- <laughs> he said, we're supposed to get dressed, not pants. <laughs> I patted him on the back and I said, I'll never forget that. When you have these wise elders give you these little good one-liners, write them in your Bible. My Bible's full of one-liners from Brother Arnold and Brother Jerry Kendall. I have them all written in the front, front and back of my Bible with a date on them. There are some good ones. I could probably just do a whole sermon of Brother Jerry Kendallisms. <laughs> so that made me laugh. So what Hebrew men wore was more similar to what we would call a dress or a skirt today. I mentioned that there are 12 times in the King James Version where the English word skirt is used and in every single instance it's talking about a man's skirt. Remember where Boaz covered Ruth with his skirt or where 10 men from the Goy or the Goyim from the nations they take hold of the skirt of him that is a Yehudim, a Jew. I think that Jew there is Yeshua. I think that's what it's talking about. I could be wrong, but that's my understanding of it. Zechariah 8.23. And of course, we have one word back in Genesis 3.21. One word, one Hebrew word, katanath, describes the garment that Yahweh Elohim gave both the man and the woman. He didn't give Adam a set of trousers and Eve a pretty floral pattern dress. He gave them a katanath, both of them. Here's a great quote and a great point from an article that I read many years ago. I looked it back up. You can still find it online. This is from Mr. Jason Young, who used to be a part of the Pentecostal church and is no longer. But he wrote an article titled The Truth About Deuteronomy 22 and 5, and he says this, quote, A thorough study into the clothing norms of the Bible reveals that there was no distinction between men's and women's clothing in the Bible beyond stylistic differences such as trim, color and size. In fact, God himself made clothing for Adam and Eve that was so similar that one word, katanath, could describe the specific garment he made for each of them. This same word describes the clothing worn by godly men and women throughout the Bible from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Yet today many Christians demand much more than even the Bible did by requiring not only a difference in style but a difference in function and form as well. If God makes no such clothing demands on his people, then who are we to make them? Do we know better than God? End of that quote. Very good quote by Mr. Jason Young. I appreciate his article. It'd be a good one if you want to study it. One objection or one point that I've had some people bring me over the years when I talk about this in casual conversation is that there are five mentions in the Bible And this is whether you deal with the English version of the Bible or the Hebrew. Five mentions of breaches. Now this is King James Version, breaches. We're going to talk about some other versions here in a second. Here's one of the mentions of breaches in Exodus 28, 42 through 43. It says, 
and thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness. From the loins, even unto the thighs, they shall reach. And they shall be upon Aaron and upon his sons when they come into the tabernacle of the congregation or when they come near unto the altar to minister in the holy place, that they bear not iniquity and die. It shall be a statute forever unto him and his seed after him. So all five occurrences of the word breaches or Hebrew miknas are in the exact same context, the Aaronic priesthood or the Levite priesthood. Never are the breeches commanded to be worn by common Hebrew men or Hebrew women for that matter. I want you to notice that the breeches here in Exodus are not pants in the sense as we wear them today. They are basically underwear. As a matter of fact, my HCSB translates all five instances as undergarments. Undergarments. They reach from the waist to the thigh. And in the context of the priesthood, this is important, in the context of the priesthood, they're never worn by the priest by themselves. You'll never see an Aaronic priest walking around the temple in nothing but the breeches on. You'll never see an Aaronic priest walking around the temple in the breeches and a t-shirt. As a matter of fact, you would never see the breeches of the priest. They were underwear. They were undergarments. They wore the breeches under their robe. Back in verse 4, same chapter, Exodus 28, we read, And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate, an ephod, and a robe and a broidered coat, a miter, and a girdle. And they shall make holy garments for Aaron thy brother and his sons, so that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. So we have the robe, the coat, the girdle, the ephod, and the breastplate. They were all worn over top of the breeches. The breeches obviously were put on first, and then the rest of the holy garments for the priest were put on after the breeches. So you would never see the breeches of the priest. It's just like when you and I go out in public, no one sees our underwear. They see the clothes that we have over top of our underwear. Other Bible translations do not call them breeches. The English Standard Version says linen undergarments. Brenton's Septuagint says linen drawers. <laughs> In Leviticus 16, 4, where they're mentioned again as a holy priestly garment, the New English Translation says linen leggings. The point is we are dealing with a type of shorts that are used as underwear. We are not talking about in these texts a pair of Levi jeans like many men wear today. So a long time ago when I first studied this subject, I started studying this back in 2003 to 2004. I went through a time in my life where I began to re-examine everything that I believed, everything that I had been taught. I figured I found out there was one thing that I was taught that was wrong and it was that we just call the Creator God and Lord. So I found out that that was wrong, and he actually has a name that he wants us to call on. So I said, well, if they taught me that wrong, what about everything else? And so I began to examine every single thing that I was taught. Some things I kept on holding to. Some things I didn't change, but there were other things that I did change. So in 03 and 04, I started to study about the garments for women, and then it led me down a rabbit trail, and some people say, well, you should have never went down that rabbit trail. One sister told me, she said back then, she said, Brother Matthew, I wished you would have just left well enough alone. <laughs> I said, well, that's not my style. We want to go to what the Scripture says. When I first started studying the subject, I thought initially that the high priest and the priests up under him that wore these breeches they would wear them when they ministered so that, let's say by some chance, if they were elevated or up on a high plateau and there was a community of Israelites around them that they might perhaps see up under the robe of the priest. And so he had the breeches on for modesty in those cases. I thought initially Exodus 28:42 was talking about covering nakedness in general. I think I was wrong in that initial thinking. I think I can prove that. Later on in my studies, I realized that did not make sense. And the reason it doesn't make sense is because of the text that led up to this series, Exodus 20, 26. There's a commandment in Exodus 20, 26 that an altar was not to be approached by steps, much less a ladder. So the priest, when he was working the altar there at the, the holy place, or if a, a common Hebrew man had built an altar and was working the altar, 
the man would not have to go up steps or a ladder to start with. They could stand on the ground and work the altar. Let's say an altar was as high as this pulpit. You could work the top of the altar without going up at an elevated spot. So nobody would be looking up under anybody's robe in those instances. So I think a better understanding here is that the breaches were on the priests. It says to cover their nakedness, but it's talking about covering their nakedness securely in the presence of Yahweh. It's not dealing with covering nakedness in general in the presence of men and women in society when I go out. It's talking about being covered in the presence of Yahweh. Nobody is seeing the breaches, but Yahweh wants the priest covered securely in the midsection. Listen carefully again to the context of Exodus 28, 42. It says, They, the linen breeches, shall be upon Aaron and upon his sons when? When they come in unto the tabernacle of the congregation or when they come near unto the altar to minister in the holy place. The covering of nakedness here is not covering one's nakedness among society in public. It's covering one's nakedness in Yahweh's special presence at the tabernacle or at the altar. So Genesis 3.21 with the Katanith for Adam and Eve, that teaches us how men and women are supposed to cover their nakedness in general from the shoulders all the way to below the thighs. Biblically, that's nakedness from the shoulders to below the thighs. Exodus 28.42 teaches us how a priest was to cover his nakedness when he ministered before Yahweh in the holy things. So catch this. A priest could be all by himself ministering in the temple. He could be all by himself and he would still have to wear the linen breeches because he was in the presence of Yahweh. For, so for whatever reason, Yahweh said, linen breeches. I want that part of your nakedness covered securely. And then there's a text in Ezekiel that says he wants them to be linen so that they won't sweat as bad. That's what it says in Ezekiel, I think it's chapter 44. Now, the argument goes something like this from the people that I've heard that say, say that pants are a man's garment. The argument goes that the priests were men, so the breeches are worn by men. The rebuttal, my rebuttal to that argument that I've never gotten a secondary rebuttal to, my rebuttal is threefold. Number one, there's nothing here about men in general, only about priests. Two, the breeches were worn underneath the tunic or robe so no person would ever see them anyhow except the man that put them on. And three, just because something is said to be worn by a priest doesn't mean a similar shaped garment wasn't ever worn by a common man or common Hebrew woman. Exodus 28 verse 4 says that one of the priestly garments was the broidered coat, that's KJV, broidered coat. That word coat there in Hebrew is the katanath. Same word as Genesis 3.21 for the clothes of Adam and Eve. So if you say that the breeches are only for men because they're mentioned here for the priest, then what about the katanath? Should a woman not wear that because it's mentioned here for the priest? See, the argument breaks down. It's not a good argument. Or think about this. What about the belt or the girdle? The belt or the girdle is said to be a holy garment here for the priest. Does that mean a woman can't wear a belt or a girdle? See, it doesn't make sense. It's not a good argument. What it is, I'm going to tell you what it is. It is a grasping for a straw argument that some Christians use who do not want to give up the man-made doctrine that pants are for men and dresses are for women. It is a man-made doctrine. It's a tradition of men. Here's a quote that I have from a book, a quote from a book I have titled Manners and Customs in the Bible by Victor Matthews and this is on pages 117 to 119 quote, the basic dress for both men and women was the katanath, a shirt-like garment which is depicted in ancient art in a variety of styles usually made of wool, it could reach as far as the ankles or just to the knees it might have either long or short sleeves this garment is mentioned in the black obelisk inscription of the Assyrian king Shalmaneser III from 842 BC. That's an old stone monument. In a series of sculpted caption registers, Jehu, the king of Israel, is depicted bowing down before the king. His servants are shown carrying gifts as tribute payments. Jehu is wearing a fringed katanath tied with a girdle, which also has tassels hanging from it. We should be familiar with the tassels, right? Numbers 15, Deuteronomy 22. 
His head is covered by a pointed cap and his beard like those of the Israelite porters carved on this monument is trimmed to a point. On the screen is the stone inscription that's mentioned in the book, Manners and Customs in the Bible. It's actually housed at the British Museum in London. If anybody ever travels there and you visit the British Museum, you can go and see the stone there on display. You can see the ancient cuneiform writing, the Assyrian writing there at the top on the left, and you can see the full black obelisk stone there on the right from the Assyrian king. At the top in the writing, it describes what's going on in each block or panel on the stone. Now, on panel number two, is a chiseling of King Jehu or King Yehu, whose name means he is Yah. He's bowing down and he's wearing this robe, katanath in Hebrew, with tassels. Now, it's also interesting, this was pointed out to me years ago, that in this inscription, uh, ancient inscription, it appears that Jehu is donning the, the side locks, the peyote, from the temples of his head. One brother up in Michigan years ago pointed this out to me. I was studying Leviticus 19, 27 back then about the, the, uh, the borders of the beard and the rounding of the borders of the head. And this brother sent me an article, and this was a Messianic brother. Uh, he would consider himself a Gentile. He wouldn't consider himself a Hebrew, uh, at least uh, not uh, by blood, but he was adopted into the family, he would say. But this brother, I noticed when I met him, I shook his hand and he had these curly peyote that came down here from the temples. And you see this in the Hasidic Jewish community. Um, uh, just like Christians have various understandings on texts, so also Jewish people have various understandings on texts. And so you might have a Hasidic Jew who is very observant to the Torah and they believe that you cannot even trim the hair that comes off the temples. I could probably teach a whole sermon just, just on that part of Leviticus 19.27. I take a little slightly different view of that. Maybe one day I'll review my notes and teach on it. But just thought I'd bring it up. It's very interesting that this stone inscription shows King Jehu with these uh, curly side locks there, peyotes. And King Jehu was probably, if I'm not mistaken, one of the, if not the, most righteous king in the nation of Israel after the nation split to Israel and Judah. There were some really, really good kings in Judah, not so in the northern house of Israel. Jehu was one of the best. He wasn't fully devoted to Yahweh, but he was, he was one of the best. So the main point here is that in this ancient stone inscription mentioned in this Bible dictionary, Manners and Customs in the Bible by Victor Matthews, and it's mentioned in every single Bible dictionary that I have, and I probably have, I don't know, maybe 10? Every single dictionary that I have says basically the same thing, that the everyday dress of both Hebrew men and women was the katana tunic slash robe. It was not pants for men and dresses for women. It is really an undisputed point in scholarship. And let me tell you, when you start studying what the scholars say, you don't find many points that are undisputed. Usually the scholars always disagree about something. This is one that is pretty much undisputed. It's just that not many people want to push it to its logical conclusion. Genesis 3.21 does not teach that male and female must just be clothed. It teaches that male and female must be clothed modestly. Most Christians that I've run into would use Genesis 3.21 to tell us that we can't walk around naked. But Genesis 3.21 teaches more than that. It doesn't just teach that you can grab anything. So a pair of swimming trunks alone on, on a man or a bikini on a woman, it doesn't fit the criteria of Genesis 3.21. doesn't fit it at all. It's a verse that Christians have skimmed over without digging into it and taking it seriously. I might add briefly here that according to Genesis 3.21, it is just as wrong for a man to go topless in public as it is for a woman to go topless in public. The only reason that people today, including Christians, do not view it this way is due to our modern culture. It's not due to the Bible. It's due to modern culture. And as the old saying goes here, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. <laughs> amen. I didn't get too many amens on that now. <laughs> so a follower of Yahweh, a servant of Yahweh, and that's who I'm preaching to today. Follower of Yahweh is not authorized to just wear anything he or she wants and claim, well, I'm covered. If we do that, 
we're basically doing the same thing that Adam and Eve did in Genesis 3-7. Remember where they took them fig leaves and made loincloths, KJV aprons, but loincloths is better, like little Mowgli wore on Jungle Book. And they covered just their midsection, basically like some of the swimming suits you see out you know, on the beach. It's not sufficient. It's not sufficient. Genesis 3.21, Yahweh made, Asa, appointed, instituted, ordained the tunics to cover their nakedness. Yahweh doesn't recognize the fig leaves as modest apparel. He appointed a specific garment for male and female that covers nakedness modestly. And devout Hebrew men and women wore it from Genesis 3.21 all the way down to the book of Revelation. It never changed. And it actually, when you study history, which I'm not going to get into in, in this sermon or this series, but when you study Christian history, it actually went beyond the book of Revelation and it didn't start changing for Christians until around the 14 to 1500s AD. So about 1500 years after the time of the Messiah, that's when it began to change. And then we get into uh, modern Western culture and we think Ward and June Cleaver is what we should be looking for <laughs> to know how we ought to look as men and women and that's just not the case. So, today we come to the close of this series. This is part three in this particular series, and then I'll move into Exodus 21 the next time that I teach. Um, what I want to do here at the close is I want to answer some questions that I've gotten over the last three weeks. I want to give some advice, and I also want to encourage you all in the subject of modesty and dress. Now, on some of this that I'm going to talk about, there is no specifics in Scripture. Everything is not black and white, brothers and sisters. There are some gray areas. And on the gray areas, I'm going to do like the Apostle Paul did sometimes. I'm going to give my opinion. Now, it's just my opinion. Um, you are required as men, especially leaders of our homes, but also women of Yahweh, are required to study the Bible and come to your conclusion and follow what you genuinely believe the Bible is teaching on any given subject. And so it's not my job to be the head of every home in here. I'm not. I'm the head of my home. But every man in here is the head of the priest of his home. And uh, so I'm not going to go over anybody's head. Um, I'm just trying to be a good shepherd. And as a faithful servant and a faithful minister of the word, I'll do like Paul and I'll give you what I think is best on some of these gray areas. This is actually the first time. I went back and looked at this. This is the first time in about 10 to 11 years that I've taught on this subject from the pulpit. Now, I talk about it often in casual conversation, not because I bring it up, but because a lot of people ask me, what are you wearing? <laughs> what are you wearing? Like a chef coat, you know, or uh, one of those guys that inspect the cars when they come off the line. And he's got a little pen and a, a notepad. <laughs> what are you wearing, Matthew? What are you wearing? So it's been about 10 or 11 years. It might be another 10 or 11 years before I talk about it again. I don't know. I am not going to harp on this subject. I'm not one of those preachers that harp on one subject. I believe, as, as uh, Paul told the elders of Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, I have not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of Elohim. And so I teach the level of knowledge that I know, then I move on to the next subject. So that when I die, I have a wide var uh, variety and range of teachings, and I might be able to say like the Apostle Paul, that I've done my best to declare the whole counsel. I do want to encourage you to let go of your modern thinking and maybe let go of some of your pride. There's a lot of pride involved in not wanting to accept what the Bible teaches on many things. Um, just take an honest look at what I've taught from the Bible for these past three sermons and Yahweh's Spirit will lead you and guide you in His time. So some sisters here and on social media have asked me Brother Matthew, what about dresses and skirts? Are they similar to the tunic? And my answer is yes. Some dresses are basically tunics. That's what they are. And some skirts cover the body in the exact same way that a tunic does. It drapes over the midsection loosely of the body. So that's really the goal here, not to reveal the shape of our body. The clothes that we wear should complement us, complement our face and complement our, our look. They should not reveal our body, but complement our body. Um, our nakedness is something that is private to you as an individual, or if you're married, it's private between you and your spouse. It's not for the whole world to see. Remember, mod uh, modesty is about honor. Modesty in outward dress is about honor, dignity, and privacy. 
I've also been asked about loose pants. Well, Brother Matthew, don't you know some pants are loose? Come on, Brother Matthew. <laughs> yes, some pants are more modest than others. It's true. I have some linen pants that don't hug my midsection like a tight pair of blue jeans would or maybe a pair of those priestly linen leggings. <laughs> I have a pair of my linen pants on today. They changed my life. <laughs> it's the best pants I ever bought. Tisha calls them my harem pants. <laughs> But uh, it's the best pants I ever bought. You'll be blessed, brothers, if you order you some. But I don't wear my linen pants without a tunic. But if I did, I would be more modest than I would in some pants that I could buy from the store. But I'm not interested in being more modest. I'm interested in what does the Scriptures teach. That's what I'm interested in. What did Yahweh appoint? So that's why I dress the way that I do. Men, let me talk to the men. I know this different. The men don't, don't get talked too much on modesty sermons. Not the ones I've heard. My sons sometimes send me clips of uh, independent fundamental Baptist preachers that talk about modesty, and they basically scream at the women. Um, I mean, you have a, really a man that shouldn't really be up in front of somebody preaching, and he's dressed in a way that he shouldn't be dressed, and he's sitting in a way that he shouldn't be sitting as a minister of the gospel, and yet he's screaming at the women to, to be modest. That's kind of how it was whenever the subject was approached when I was growing up. It's always directed to the women. So I've talked a lot to the men. I'm going to talk to the men right now, speaking to the men here. I know this is a hard saying. <laughs> it's a hard teaching. When I first started wearing my tunics back in 2004, I got stared at by so many people. I still get stared at by so many people. I look normal to me, that's because I see myself every day. I still don't look normal to anybody when I go out in public. I still get stared at. It doesn't bother me now, but it used to bother me greatly. I remember the first time I wore a tunic in Kohl's. We went to Kohl's department store. Tisha wanted to get something there. This has been years ago. And everybody and their uncle was looking at me, pointing, whispering, smiling. And it was hard then. I had to get, a, get rid of a lot of Matthew Jansen's flesh. Um, this, this teaching will help you get rid of your flesh. So I still get stared at, but it doesn't bother me anymore. Not long ago, uh, I could tell you so many stories, but there's one. Not long ago, I was in line at Chick-fil-A trying to get some lunch. And I seen two of the workers, two young ladies behind the counter, and they looked at me, and they was whispering with each other and pointing at me and chuckling. I looked straight back, straight at them, and I smiled, and I went like this. Hey. <laughs> they got real red, and they went back to work, and they were doing what they were doing. <laughs> but um, it's become a way of life for me now. It doesn't bother me to be dressed like this. I know it's different. I know it's peculiar, but it doesn't bother me anymore when people do that. It's kind of like the lunar reckonings of the months and the weeks. We go by the lunar cycle for our months and our weeks, like I believe they did in the Scriptures. Um, that seems strange at first. I remember back when I first started keeping Sabbath in the uh, year 1997, it was on Saturday, and then um, November of 1997, somewhere right in there, was the first time that I went to work, like to do a commercial job on a Sunday. Now, Brother Rodney can testify to this, me and him grew up pretty much the same kind of church. You go to church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night every Wednesday night, and then you have revivals and camp meetings that sometimes last for weeks at a time. <laughs> so I went to church my whole life, but definitely on Sunday morning. It was sacrilegious not to go to church on Sunday morning. I remember the first time I was riding in the passenger seat of a pump truck going down Arnold's driveway, going to work on a Sunday morning, and I thought, well, here we go. I guess I'm working on Sunday now because I kept Sabbath on Saturday. It was strange, but the more that I kept Sabbath, the less strange it was. When I switched over to the Lunar Reckoning in uh, almost in the year 2000, late 99, it was very strange, very strange. Um, so strange that I almost stopped doing it one time. But I stayed the course and now it's become a way of life to me. My, it's the only Sabbath my children have ever known is by the heavenly calendar. And so Things sometimes are strange or difficult to understand because they're fresh and they're new to you. Recognize that something might be strange or difficult at first, but we'll, 
we'll grow into it the longer that we walk into it. The longer you walk in the truth and in righteousness, the less you want out. Once you get into it deeply, you don't want to go anywhere else because to whom will you go? Yeshua has the words of life. That's what the disciples said. Who else will we go to? You have the words of life, Master. You want to become in tune with the old Hebrew ways. Um, the Bible says look for the old paths and the ancient ways. That's not talking about Azusa Street. It ain't talking about 1950s Baptist. The old paths is talking about Enoch, Methuselah, Shem, Abraham, Moshe. Those men, that's the old paths that we should look for. How did they do things? Let's do them the same way. So men... You can begin, let me make this practical. You can begin if it's too much for you at first and you say, well, I see what Brother Matthew's saying, but it's just a little too heavy for me right now. You can begin with baby steps if it's too much to take in all at once. When you buy your shirts, they have some shirts that have long tails in the back and in the front. You can get those shirts. Some shirts are made more lengthy. They've got a T on the tag standing for tall. They're lengthy. They're about two to four inches longer than your average shirt. So you could look for those. And I would definitely encourage you as brothers in the Messiah to wear your shirts untucked and then maybe you can work your way up to a longer tunic eventually. You know, they used to teach us little boys in church, tuck your shirt in, that's presentable. You don't want to go in the church house with an untucked shirt. That's not biblical. That's not scriptural. Untuck that shirt. It's okay, brothers. It's fine. Leave it untucked. It's no problem. And I want to say here, if you don't start somewhere, then you'll gradually forget about this teaching. Psalm 119, one translation in one verse in that chapter, David said, I hurried, not hesitating to keep your commandments. Uh, and I think the understanding there is that when we see a commandment and it becomes real to us, if we don't put it to practice quickly and the longer we go without doing it, it'll gradually and gradually leave our mind and we won't think that it really matters anymore. That can go for any commandment. So that was to the men, to the women, to the sisters. The same goes for the sisters. Now, it's kind of become a little bit stylish. The reason I think that I know this is because I see these women's tunics on store racks sometimes. I don't like to shop. But sometimes I'm out where clothes are at, and I see these, uh, what I call them, mini tunics. Um, but at least it's a start. It's a start. The women can look for these type of shirts if they're wearing pants, shirts that at least cover or drape over the midsection. I think many dresses or skirts are fine as well. Um, let me add here a little bit about the tops that we wear, the tops of our clothing. I understand that sometimes our clothes will show some of our form and that's unavoidable and that's fine. And shame on people that lust after folks that are dressed modestly because some people have a lustful spirit and they'll lust after you no matter what you're wearing. Wonder what's up under your clothes. And uh, that's not right. Um, but we should not be wearing tops in public that are too tight or reveal too much of our chest area. I've seen some men who we used to say, well, he strikes himself as a ladies man, doesn't he? Because he left a few buttons unbuttoned, showing a little hair with a gold chain coming down. I don't know what women find attractive about that to start with. <laughs> so uh, that's not appropriate. It's, it's not appropriate for a female to show off too much of her chest area. Um, according to Genesis 3.21, covering nakedness in general is from the shoulders to at least below the thigh. I don't really like shorts, but I don't think scripturally, I don't think the bottom of the leg is nakedness in the Bible. I can't find that in the Bible. Um, I think a tunic above the knee or with shorts is sufficient. I had a brother message me today and ask me about sleeves. He said, I've been listening to your sermons on tunics and what about sleeves? And I I told him, I said, well, I mean, I could learn some more, but as far as I can see in the scriptures, I don't really see anything in scripture where sleeves are mandatory, um, especially in the summertime when Hebrew men and women would work in the garden. They probably wore short-sleeved or sleeveless tunics. Uh, that's a gray area. That's, you know, these are things you have to decide for yourself. Um, the main thing is be cautious. Be cautious when we go shop. What do we do? We look for clothes that we like, the style, the color, the pattern. But the first thing we should ask is, is this modest? Is this going to present me in a way, a Christian way, a Hebrew way, Hebrew Christian way? <laughs> is it going to present me like that? Or is it going to scream that I'm not Hebrew, I'm not mm. Christian? Be cautious. Let Yah's Spirit guide you in the gray areas and always, always ask yourself, 
if something's modest. The tunic is very modest. And if you put this into practice and you start becoming conscious about what you wear, you will start to notice how much more modest a tunic is than regular clothes. You will. I know this because I'm a people watcher. Now I know none of you are people watchers. <laughs> but I'm a people watcher. And you'll see people at the grocery store or wherever out in public, you'll see some in pants and then sometimes I'll see a person in a in a coat in the wintertime, a long coat that goes below the midsection and it's obvious which one is, is more modest. You'll immediately notice how much more modest the tunic is than a pair of pants. I don't believe men or women should wear pants as an outward garment. Uh, people ask me, they say, well, then you're saying women shouldn't wear pants. No, no. I think women are authorized to wear pants like men. I just think both sexes should wear a tunic over top of the pants. So I don't think that a woman shouldn't wear pants because it's a man's garment. It's not. It's a neutral garment. I think that men and women should both uh, wear tunics and not pants alone. Do you know how hard it is to teach a sermon like this? Uh, I've, sh I've shaved a little bit up here, and everybody in here is my friends and my family and my loved ones. Um, so let's all take a deep breath. <laughs> I had added, added a little bit of humor in here to kind of ease my mind. Um, let me say this as I close. I really appreciate everyone's attentiveness to this series. I appreciate your attentiveness in general. But especially, I've seen some of you that are really trying to listen and look and watch intently. I'm just trying to be a good shepherd. The word pastor and shepherd in Greek is synonymous. Ephesians 4, he gave some pastors. The same word for shepherds, like shepherd over a flock of sheep. I think it's poimen, if I'm not mistaken. I'm trying to be a good shepherd. I'm trying to speak where the Bible speaks, be silent where it's silent, and if I give my opinion, tell you beforehand, this is what Brother Matthew thinks, but it's my opinion. As a faithful servant, yes, but it's just my opinion. You have to decide on your own. I'm not interested in policing anybody. I'm just interested in encouraging everybody in holiness, outward holiness. So, like I said before, I'm not going to talk about this much anymore. Um, I only preached on it because Exodus 20:26 20, talked about nakedness, and I said, well, this is a good verse to catapult a series on uh, decency and modesty. This past week, I went through my booklet, Modest Apparel for Men and Women. I haven't worked on that booklet since 2011. I told Tisha that today. I have no idea where those last 11 years went. But it's been that long since I worked on that booklet. So this past week, I went through it. I updated it. I revised it. I changed the way that I said some things. And I posted it online in the book section of my website this morning for the whole world to read and see what I believe the Bible teaches and what I've mentioned in these sermons. The, the book does go into more detail than the sermons. There are more reference works mentioned in there. And I hope that you'll take the time to read and study it. And I hope that you'll take the time and find more reference works and more things that will prove whatever the Bible teaches. That's what we want, whatever the Bible teaches. So I love everybody. And I love everyone here right where you're at. And it's because Yahweh loves me where I'm at. And I'm not where I ought to be yet. He's still working on me. And He loves me. So I love everybody here right where you're at. When we share this message with others, if you get caught in a corner and somebody starts questioning you and asking you about this, modesty in general, when you share it, share it in kindness. Don't be bragging. Don't be haughty. Share it in kindness. Don't be judgmental. That song we sing, Don't Let Me Judge But Love, kind of an anthem here for our assembly. Brother Ron wrote it. We love Brother Ron. It's talking about not being judgmental. We have to all make judgments every day. All of us have to judge. We judge right from wrong. We judge if somebody's doing right, if somebody's doing wrong. It's talking about not having a judgmental attitude to where you're nitpicking everybody that you meet. You're looking down your nose at everybody that you come across. You think you're better than everybody that you come across because you know a little bit about the Bible. It's not how we ought to be. We ought to be kind and gentle to people. So when people ask us, we share them, not with a stuck-up judgmental attitude, but with a kindness, a spirit of gentleness. Yahweh's people should be the kindest people on the earth. So let's not pounce on anyone with the modesty message. Let's mainly share it by example. And when somebody asks... 
Be as gentle and patient with them as Yahweh has been with you. That's my sermon for today. And we'll go into our prayer requests and testimony services right after we sing. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall think on it day and night. Be careful to do what Yah tells you to do so that you will have good success. Don't turn to the right, don't turn to the left, but stay on the narrow path. Be careful to do what Yah tells you to do so that you will have good success. I love everybody. Shalom.